I think I punched a wall beforehand because I was like, come on, Olivia, just get there, just cry. Because I just, the pressure to, so then I think I got myself into a stay in, in a cupboard somewhere before we did it. Because again, like, I don't have any tools. I'm just like trying to dredge it up from somewhere. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Olivia Cook is an actor. She sat down with me in cyberspace to talk about the work. Do you have a typical way that you like to begin your preparation process for a role? No. No, I don't. I, I, I flail a little bit and I procrastinate a lot when it, in terms of beginning to prep for a role. And I don't, I don't know if that's a reluctance or a fear of eventually doing the job and, and the fear of not executing it properly that I delayed the prep in a way, but it, it always does feel like a bit of a rush, a last minute rush. And wh- and where is that stemming from? Is it, I mean, is that, is that like, because you know that there's, there are things that are going to matter that are not stuff that you can put your fingers on? I think so. I think I'm really bad at intellectualizing what it is that I do and what actually my method is because I don't really think I have one and I always feel like because I didn't go to drama school I didn't train formally I have a lack of um vocabulary for it and a lack of tools and in instead I just go off this really guttural instinctual response and then I think I feel quite shy for not being able to talk at length about it because as you know actors can talk for fucking ages about what they did to prepare for a role. And I also like, I just find that really boring as well. Like hearing the chat about what they did for a role. It's then like, you would yeah, not like this podcast too much. No, no, I do that on the contrary, because I, I find that there are some, there are a lot of actors that are like me that would rather talk about like memories from set or like yes. the connection they had with another, another actor. And it's, and it's less trying to, score points for how brave they were right right know? right 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 but you know i heard you say that you you're malleable uh in terms of process uh based on you know how the director mm. likes to work and i and i've heard other actors say that and i'm i'm curious like is this a is this a coping mechanism that has developed over the projects where you're like realizing like I have to be like that otherwise if I come in rigid about how that how I work butting heads against the director that's not going to work or 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 is it just part of the fun and part of the pleasure yeah I think it's part of the pleasure and also the chemistry of each set is so different from the next that you have to be malleable otherwise I mean I'm I'm always fearful about being the company con and I haven't been thus far, I don't think. Um, but and I say con as a term term of, inf- term, term of in, um, affection <laughs> yes. rather than the American version. Um, yes. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, yeah, I just think oh, you have to have a laugh and you have to have a sense of humor with this job, and I think that's what's the most important. So I think if you come in with a rigidness. I think that implies that you take yourself really seriously, which I don't, nor do I take this job that seriously in terms of like what I do. I'm very grateful for it. And I feel like very lucky to be able to do it. But, you know, a lot of the time we're paid quite handsomely to learn our lines, you know, cry on camera or, you know, do whatever and then we go off and you know when it's not COVID times we all have a drink at the pub afterwards so you know I do think that it all has to be handled with a level of um light-heartedness in a way and do you find that that's harder to stay with as as you get more um successful no no, I think the the more films I do, or the le- or the more known I am, in inverted commas, I think the funnier and the more, <laughs> more bizarre it is. 
You know what I mean? Yeah, it is, yeah. It's absurd. It's absurd. The, it your so life is absurd. Yeah. So yeah, and I think God, I never want to take myself too seriously. And I, and I, you know, I feel like I grew up with a strong sense of humor and the ability to take the piss out of yourself and the, the piss out of other people. And I think if I lose that, then I'm losing an integral part of who I am. Mm, yes. You know, hearing this makes me wonder when, when, when I heard that um, Darius Martyr wanted to shoot Sound of Metal completely chronologically, wanted you to learn your instrument, wanted you to sing or scream or whatever and perform for real and we're gonna shoot on film and you know all of this sounds really like <laughs> this kind of serious thing like when your character leaves at the beginning of the second act you olivia leave mm. and then you come back a couple months later i'm assuming to film the last act and it's like come on just let me um let me do the work here you know like that that would be what i would uh, mm. w would take but i'm purposely being too hard on him to, to free so you can defend the process because i'm sure it was oh, helpful no. i'm going to defend the pro process because yeah. um that's incredibly helpful for an actor because i'm not having to think of okay in this scene i just filmed the last scene which was you know 30 pages in advance okay so where where have i been where what am i about to do emotionally where have i been and so i'm not having to remind myself because each scene takes place directly after the last scene that we've shot um and in terms of shooting on film i mean shoot, film is so expensive so we only had two or three takes which made us be more in the moment mm. and more on my on my behalf more prepared emotionally but still like me personally i learned to do my own thing within the confines of that process that mm. darius has set for the the set you know i'm, I'm not emotionally staying in it between takes because i can't i can't do that I'll, i'd knacker myself out i'd be too tired yeah. and then i wouldn't be able to be as present or as emotionally available for riz if I was just like constantly just like taking myself off to a corner and like being in this dire state that's, I just can't, can't do that. Also like, it's not good just for, you know, your life personally, your mental health. If you're just, you know, for two months on end, just in this very dark place. And what about having to learn to play the music and to be in the band and to actually perform? I mean, this, sounds like i i think i benefited as an audience member you know but i i'm not sure as it was happening i was thinking i think this is a real performance mm -hmm. but i probably got it and was just in it more than i would have been if it wasn't i mean is, is that the way you you thought it would be or because or, you spent months right preparing to do that that work i came on a bit later another actress dropped out and so Riz had been learning the drums for six months. Oh, yeah. And then I came in with six weeks before shooting. It's still a lot. But it's a challenge, <laughs> isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm doing this job, and then the director's like, I want you to learn the guitar and play it for real. And then I'm suddenly given all these tools in which that I'm able to do that, which is like an amazing skill. I mean, I've forgotten everything, but um, <laughs> it's an amazing skill to do in the moment and an amazing challenge the performance itself was absolutely mortifying and you have to just kind yeah. of disassociate whilst you're doing it. Um, but that's what I liked about the way it was filmed. It's not showy. It's yes. not like, yes. look at these actors, look at what they're doing, look how amazing they are. It's just about the characters and the that's storytelling. True. Yes, yes, that's true. That's why I loved it. Uh, I'd like to talk about two scenes in two different movies. One of them is from uh, Sound of Metal, but first I um, Katie says goodbye because I want to talk about the last scene. Mm. That scene is one shot. It reminded me of what um, Adele Anel had to do at the end of Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Oh, have, wow. you, have you seen that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, kind of knowing that this is the end of the movie, it's one shot, and you have to go through a variety of of emotional states in this one shot and it i mean just talk to me about your approach to that scene the day 
it happened, what you needed. I'm trying to remember on the day. Well, I, th- I think I was really nervous because Dwayne Roberts, the director, wanted to shoot it within magic hour. And you know, there's like 15 minutes, not even an hour, it's 15 oh minutes. And having to kind of logistically place the trucks and and have it all timed out in a way and then trying to cry on cue and have that breakdown and then have this like, this, um, this moment where she takes stock. It's also one of those where that was a really special time of my life because it felt like one of the first times where I was, I was given the opportunity to do, to take on a role that that was that, um emotional and and strong and to try and carry a film like that and we just it was one of those just like magical times just in Albuquerque in the spring with all these people I moved to New York afterwards and was there for four years and just it was life-changing that way and so within that scene I'm sure there was just an element of massive trust on Wayne and a certain amount of channeling this character that I'd played for two and a half months at that time. But I remember, I think I punched a wall beforehand because I was like, come on, Olivia, just get there, just cry. Cause I just, the pressure to, so then I think I got myself into a stay in, in a cupboard somewhere before <laughs> we did it. Cause again, like I don't have any tools. I'm just like trying to dredge it up from somewhere. <laughs> That's amazing. The other scene is your last scene in sound of metal which i just watched again how did you guys get to where you needed to get to because on i'm I'm sure on paper like i tried to imagine that scene on paper and it's just like there's no way that you would be able to get what you guys gave us uh on paper you know in terms of what what happens and it just seems like it's so delicate how you know what he's talking about when he says the words, um, it's okay. You know, we can see it on your, I mean, it's just such a beautiful cinematic moment between two actors that I really, really appreciate. But I just wanted to know, like, is this something that came out of um, the rehearsal that you guys had? And, and, or, or, or is, it, is it a product of having gone away like you went away and and coming back in and doing it and doing it like that did, did that all count toward this moment yeah i think i mean the writing was so beautiful and the kind of the documentation of in the beginning of the film if you spot it she's got this patch that she itches out of her habit and then he sees her again and he's like oh god you've not itched anymore and she's like oh no 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 i've not and then they're in bed much later and then she starts itching again and it's just this like it's an embodiment of just her anxiety towards this relationship that she didn't realize that she had until she notices that she's begun to itch again. For me, that's that's really weird. That's that, that's in the script because oftentimes when I'm nervous or like I'm really anxious, I, I will like I've got a patch on the back of my leg that I that's all scarred because I'll scratch it so much ever since I was a child. Um, So I knew where that feeling was coming from. But also this, we were a little bit estranged at that point, Riz and I and the director and the characters, because we'd had this really intense experience in the beginning. And then I hadn't seen them for a month and a half and they'd had their own experiences in the middle of the film. And it was odd, you know, because we had, in weirdly, in that month and a half, the dynamic had really shifted. And I think we just used that to our advantage. I accompanied a, uh, an elderly friend to, to get um, his vaccine here in New York a couple of weeks ago. And a, and a scene played out on the line that was very similar to a scene in your new movie, <laughs> Little Fish. Oh, yeah. An elderly man came up and wanted to see if he can 
like get in the back of the line if he didn't have an appointment. And this woman was very harshly telling him, you can if you want to, but you're probably not going to get in. I mean, it was terrible. I mean, it was just insane. It was like apocalyptic <laughs> kind of moment. And I'm like, should should we, you know, give this spot up to this person who's older than even this person that I'm with? Yeah. But so tell us about this movie. That's I mean, this was done before this predicament we're in and and i and right i mean and it's it's somehow going to be oddly i think cathartic for us to watch this movie do you <laughs> yes i do i think people want i know it sounds weird i think people want to i think people are annoyed at things that aren't pandemic related right now oh well that's interesting i you know i was sent the short story by my agent four years ago wow. now. Um, a gorgeous short story by a writer called Asia Gable, who's a novelist. And she just created this, this world that was so just deeply melancholic and so gorgeous and so heartbreaking. And I could just see it um, play out in just really cinematically. And so we got the rights and um, got um, a writer on board called Matson Tomlin. And we then shot it after two years of adap adapting the short story, we shot it in 2019 in March. And, you know, we were thought that this was the most mental science fiction <laughs> scenario ever. And it's about, a, it's a love story between two people and the backdrop is, a global pandemic, which is an airborne illness that's causing people to have Alzheimer's-like symptoms where they're forgetting everything and forgetting themselves. And yeah, we just couldn't fathom it. And then, you know, nine months later, we, you start hearing about COVID-19 in Wuhan and you just cannot write it. And there was talks about bringing out the film last year when everyone went, I mean, when we were all in the midst of it for the first yeah. time. And I was just like, no, like this just feels like, let's not fucking cash out on the fact that everyone's <laughs> in a pandemic. Yeah. And they're like, also, who's going to want to see that? It's so anxiety inducing. But now it feels like we're here forever and you have to, you know, put a movie out once it's done or else people don't get paid. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it, show, it shows you what I know. I mean, I don't, I guess that's why I don't have a job of, of, of releasing movies because I would have thought that it's a perfect time to release it because I, I, I mean, people were writing me ask saying to me, why didn't you ask so-and-so about how they're dealing with the pandemic? And I'm like, I, I don't know. Cause this is about acting and we're talking, I mean, we're talking about something they did. Three years ago. I mean, people yeah. want to hear like their life is so wrapped up in this. I think that they want to he see other people struggling or something in stories. I think this is going to be something like that's going to go on throughout the rest of this year. It'll be, yeah. I mean, it will, and who knows thereafter. Um, it's just such a strange one. I mean, if I'd known this was going to happen, I probably would have done a better performance. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've been a bit too, I've been a bit too nervous to watch it back since we've entered this new phase in history. Mm. Um, so I don't know how it holds up, really, but. I mean, for me personally, I'm so sick of talking about the current pandemic that we're in that now today having to promote Little Fish, I'm just like, I don't know what I'm going to fucking talk about. <laughs> really? I mean, so just just take my word for it, even though it might not be true. Some people are going to need it. You know, I, I really believe that, you know, I really believe that. I mean, there's some people that are sick of talking about similar things, but there's some people that want stories like this right now i think yeah. when we're in the middle of it maybe when we're back we don't we, like just like what happened with a uh, hundred years ago apparently nobody talked about that whole thing you right. know you can't find writings about it, you can't have stories about it that might be like that with us we might not want to talk about masks next mm. year at all but i think now when we're wearing masks <laughs> we want to talk about it for some or some people do you know i don't know is there something that you do when you're not working, which I'm assuming has happened quite a bit during this time, that you 
you do to kind of feed the work? I started writing last year for the first time. I've always like jotted things down and, but I found that a really cathartic way of just one exercising some demons and two, just having all these little voices in my head that I could um, develop and mold, which I think did satisfy that the actor in me. Um, Cause I was world building in a way that I wasn't able to do mm. on set. Um, so that was really interesting. And I found like, it made, it made me feel clearer, um, made me feel a lot more buoyant. This was in the summer as well though. So it was nice outside. I was getting vitamin D and going bike riding. Um, <laughs> so there might've been that as well. Um, but I found that really, really helpful. And just like, you know, imagining conversations and imagining worlds where you're at a bar or like there's something like, I think we've just lost a bit of sexiness in our lives. And so I could, could be able to imagine these worlds as well, which, you know, itch to scratch. Um, but apart from that, I mean, I feel like there's been a real lack of other things that I could have done because it's not as insular as yeah. writing or watching a really amazing film or listening to a podcast or, or music. What about you? I loved this time because I don't want to do anything at all ever. And I love <laughs> not having like guilt about that. Yeah. But now it's, that's going to go away and it's going to be more guilt than ever. And, and I'm, I'm especially guilty about not writing during this time. I mean, what, what, time to be writing if there's ever been a time to write if i get out of this without having written something i should just be whatever happens to writers who don't write they get strung up on them on a typewriter keys by by their fingernails i don't know something I should mean, happen i've not written since and i feel like when i've spoken to friends that are writers you can't force it can you it has to be something that's it's true pulling you to it's true the laptop or however you choose to get things down, but I've not done it since. Cause now I'm like, Oh God, the, the thought of, you know, just unblocking the drain mm -hmm. in my mind sounds just hideous. Exactly. Olivia cook. I usually don't beg people. I'm begging you to come back on the show. Will you come back on? I'm on my knees metaphorically. Whenever you want. Oh my God, yeah. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of The Gotham, formerly IFP. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.